All right, our next speaker, all right, has a PhD in genetics and biochemistry from the University of Illinois. Uh, he also holds a master's degree for, uh, from genetics uh, that he received from Illinois State and was a postdoctorate fellow in the Department of Neurology at, the, uh, at Yale University of College of Medicine, where he also served as a faculty member. All right, he has uh, received numerous awards and honors from the National Institute of Health and other medical groups for his research and has over 185 peer-reviewed publications in print right now. All right, he is the author of the book, Cancer as a Metabolic Disease on the Origin, Management, and Prevention of Cancer, and he is currently a professor of biology at Boston College, and he will be uh, basically speaking to, us today, speaking to us today on the management of glioblastoma. So please welcome to the stage, Dr. Thomas Siegfried. Um, well, thank, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Uh, I'd like to um, thank the organizers uh, for inviting me here to share with you um, our work on glioblastoma, cancer. Um, what I will be discussing today is the, the issues, the metabolism, and therapeutic strategies to manage this disease. Put this down here. All right. So, I have no financial relationships to disclose. I will not discuss off-label use or investigational use in my presentation. So, <clears throat> this is the problem. I don't know how much you know about glioblastoma. Um, it's a very uh, deadly kind of cancer. It's, as I said, it's one of the most aggressive of all uh, primary brain tumors. The prognosis is poor. There are no effective therapies. And you know that Senator John McCain passed away from glioblastoma last year. Now, in 1926, Bailey and Cushing published the survival of glioblastoma was between eight and 14 months after diagnosis. John McCain died at 13 months after diagnosis. So what that says to us is that there have been no major advances in managing this tumor in almost 100 years. So this is a real problem. The issue, of course, is this consult, con, multiple different kinds of neoplastic cell types. We have stem cells that are rapidly proliferating, and we have these mesenchymal neoplastic microglia that are really the most invasive of the cells that exist in this tumor. So these cells have many ways to invade throughout the brain, and this is called the secondary structures of Scherer. And these cells will use various anatomical tracts in the brain to move to distant locations from the primary tumor site. There are numerous reports showing that glioblastoma can, in fact, metastasize outside of the brain. There are several reports showing that GBM cells have been found in parotid glands. Now, increased risks for dentists and dental technicians and people receiving uh, x-ray treatment. I've looked at the data. It's not yet clear. There have been a number of reports uh, about this linkage, but the epidemiological studies have a number of issues that make the connection not 100 percent, or there's a lot of debate about it. I never looked at the issue of fluoride that we heard about earlier today whether there's any linkage between that and various types of cancers, although, although it was mentioned, so we need to look more into that. So here's what we see. This is a section through the brain of someone who passed away from glioblastoma. And you can see this large dis discoloration and these large cysts that are present in the brain. But if you look closely, you'll notice that the midline of the brain is shifted to the left. 
So the demise of these poor folks is due to intracranial pressure, which usually leads to the death of the patient. The problem with these tumors is that the cells have already distally migrated through the brain, so making surgical debulking or surgical resection very, very unlikely as a curative procedure. On the right panel, those darker purple cells, those are the tumor cells, and they're on the surface of the blood, blood vessels. They're in the called the Virco Robin space, and they use these blood vessels as a railroad system or a track system to pe penetrate throughout the brain. So even in areas of normal appearing brain, you would have tumor cells in smaller numbers that would be there, and they would be ultimately responsible for the continued growth and the demise of the patient. Now, one thing we do know is that mitochondria, the energy organelle of our cells, is defective in glioblastoma and defective in almost every cancer that we have looked at. On the left side, you see the normal mitochondria. This is an electron micrograph because you can only really see these organelles under the electron microscope. So you see the stripes. Those little stripes are called cristae. And in those cristae contain the proteins and the lipids of the electron transport chain, which is ultimately responsible for our ability to generate energy through oxidative phosphorylation. The spacing between the cristae is the matrix that contains the Krebs cycle and the enzymes of the tricarbolic uh, TCA cycle of the Krebs cycle. So this little organelle is packed with information as, as well as uh, capability of producing energy. On the right panel, you see the GBM of a, mic uh, a, mi a mitochondria of a glioblastoma. You see crystallosis. This is the breakdown of the cristae. The very structure of the organelle is compromised in not only glioblastoma, but in most cancers. In biology, we know that structure determines function. If the structure of the organelle is dysfunctional or damaged, you will not obtain the function from that organelle. And the function of that organelle is to provide us with energy through oxidative phosphorylation. So we have crystallosis, and we see this, as I said, uh, in many, many cancers, not just GBM. Now this was a study done by Dighton and his group looking at morphologic, the morphology of mitochondria in control tissue outside of the tumor area and in the GBM proper. And you see that normal mitochondria appear in control regions or normal brain, and very few normal mitochondria are seen in the glioblastomate brain tissue itself. And you also see that in the, in the um, abnormal mitochondria are very few in control and enriched in the GBM tissue. This has also been seen for enzymes of the electron transport chain and many other mitochondrial functions are abnormal in glioblastoma, and I also stretch this out to include all major forms of cancer. This links you with thinking that this is not just a GBM problem, this is a full cancer problem. Now, the person who first defined cancer as a metabolic disease was Otto Warburg in the early part of the 20th century. He claimed that cancer arises from damage to cellular respiration. If the damage is too acute, the cell dies but most of the time it's chronic damage. This then is followed by a second phase of what they call uh, fermentation. It gradually compensates. You just saw the picture of the mitochondria with the damaged cristae. Well, that, that mitochondria is not gonna be able to generate energy through oxidative phosphorylation, and if that cell is going to survive, it has to survive through an alternative energy mechanism which is referred to as fermentation. So cancer cells continue to ferment lactic acid, even in the presence of 100% oxygen. This has been referred to as the Warburg effect. The issue here is that they're fermenting lactic acid because they can't respire, and they can't respire because their mitochondria are damaged, and the structural evidence and biochemical evidence is overwhelming to support this. There's been a lot of problems with the Warburg effect for people, some people say, well, cancer cells you know, don't, don't ferment, la some cancer cells don't ferment lactic acid, so Warburg must be wrong. We recently published a major paper showing that cancer cells can also ferment glutamine through the glutaminolysis, and we call this the Warburg Q effect. Q is the singular letter for glutamine. Glutamine is the most abundant amino acid in our body. 
So these tumor cells can ferment not only a carbohydrate, but also uh, an amino acid. Enhanced fermentation is the signature metabolic malady of all cancer cells. Now let's think about this for a minute. You look at a tumor and you do a genetic profile on that tumor, you will find different kinds of mutations in every single cell of the tumor. As a matter of fact, there are some tumor cells that have no mutations. So you're dealing with a very hodgepodge of information when it comes to genetic profiling or anything to do with mutations related to cancer. The issue here, of course, is that every cell in that tumor is fermenting. Every single cell in that tumor is fermenting. So we ask the question, does it make more sense to target the common metabolic problem in the cell, in the tumor, in the cancer, or does it make more sense to focus our attention on therapies that target only a few of the mutations and may not target the entire system? That's something you think about. This is the paper that we recently published with my colleague Christo Shinopoulos at Semmelweis University in Hungary. We identified mitochondrial substrate lev level phosphorylation as the missing link in Warburg's central theory. Warburg did not know about this. Now that we know that Warburg was absolutely correct and he didn't know about amino acid fermentation, we can put his theory of cancer that can better explain the disease than any current uh, theories out there, especially the somatic mutation theory, which is now discredited. The issue here, of course, is the glutaminolysis. So glutamine is metabolized to glutamate to alpha ketoglutar. This is all in the TCA cycle, the Krebs cycle, and the matrix of the mitochondria. And through the process of substrate-level phosphorylation, we, the cancer cell can generate massive amounts of energy at the succinyl-CoA ligase step in the matrix of the mitochondria. This is separate from, ox from the electron transport chain. So these tumor cells are generating massive energy using glutamine as a substrate, in addition to glucose. So when we look at energy metabolism in the normal brain, normal tissues as a matter of fact, the 10-step, you go from glucose to pyruvate, that's the 10-step Emden-Meyerhoff pathway. Pyruvate enters into the mitochondria and is fully oxidized to generate 89 to 90% energy through oxidative phosphorylation with the waste products of CO2 and, and, and water. CO2 and water is the uh, waste product of normal respiration. There's ancient pathways that we have in our bodies that go back to pre-oxygen periods of our Earth, and that includes substrate-level phosphorylation. They don't require oxygen to generate energy. And in normal cells, you get very little energy in the cytoplasm at the pyruvate kinase step, and you get very little energy at substrate-level phosphorylation at the succinate-CoA ligase step, which is both, both are kind of fermentation metabolism. Now, you look at the cancer cell, compared to what I just showed you, and it should be strikingly obvious that these cells are generating energy in a different way. So pyruvate can't go into the mitochondria because I just showed you the structural abnormalities. So it's reduced to lactic acid. Lactic acid then is dumped outside the cell, creating acidification in the microenvironment. You can get some ATP from, from lactic acid fermentation, but we think the majority of the energy is coming out of the mitochondria through the glutaminase glutaminolysis with succinate as a waste product. So between the two substrate-level phosphorylation pathways, these cells are, are alive because they're fermenting glucose and glutamine. You have to realize that nothing can live without energy. Energy is the key. All other discussion of cancer is superficial. It's energy. Without energy, the cells can't grow. It's just that simple. So here's the diagram. The two fuels that drive the beast, glucose and glutamine. We know this. There are hundreds of publications in the scientific literature documenting this. Glucose is metabolized to glucose 6-phosphate. It can go down the, the Pen, uh, Meyerhoff pathway, generates pyruvate, which is dumped outside the cell in the form of lactic acid, acidifying the microenvironment and facilitating the growth of these cells through the acidification. The pentose, the, uh, pentose phosphate pathway, PPP, will generate the, the metabolites needed for DNA and RNA synthesis at the same time producing glutathione, a powerful antioxidant, making cancer cells resistant to chemo and radiation therapy. Glutamine is coming, pouring into the cell through glutamine transporters. The amide nitrogen is used for the synthesis of DNA and RNA, as well as for facilitating glut uh, the, the glutamine, uh, glutathione. 
The glutamate goes into the, into the mitochondria and, and the glutaminolysis generates massive energy through substrate level phosphorylation and dumping succinate outside the cell. So these are the two fuels. They are there and they are abundant in the, can, in the tumor cell microenvironment. There are no other fuels in the microenvironment that can replace glucose and glutamine. It's also important to mention that tumor cells can't use fatty acids or ketones because you need a good respiration system to get energy from fatty acids and ketones. So these th things you might hear about, tumor cells can use ketone bodies and fatty acids, nonsense. They can't use them. But fatty acids can stimulate the increase of glucose and glutamine, giving the false impression that fatty acids may drive the, the fatty acids are facilitating the use of glucose and glutamine. So if most cancer cells obtain energy through fermentation, you know, what are we going to do to try to manage the disease? Well, one strategy is reduce, reduce fermentable fuels. Without the fermentable fuels, the tumor cells can't grow. It's just that simple. They can't grow without energy. So why don't we target fermentable fuels? How do you do that? Well, there are a number of different strategies that will do that. Calorie restriction, therapeutic ketosis, restricted ketogenic diets, these kinds of things. They lower blood sugars. They, they, they maintain minerals and nutrients. They elevate uh, ketone bodies, which are non-fermentable. So the key to managing this disease is you target their fermentable fuels while transitioning the whole body over to a fuel that the tumor cells can't use, but all the normal cells can use. So they can use ketone bodies. You just have to get the ketones up, but you've got to lower the glucose to get the ketones up. This also enhances mitochondrial biogenesis and oxidative phosphorylation. Yes, you can achieve this with water-only therapeutic fasting. It's a little bit more difficult, but it, it's, it's, it's workable. So the strategy then is you take and you lower your blood sugar. You lower your blood sugar and elevate the ketone bodies. What this does then is puts a, a damper, a damper on the rate of those tumor cells to grow. They can't grow fast without fermentable fuels. And at the same time, you reduce the inflammation in the microenvironment, making the cold system much less aggressive. So the key is you lower the sugar and you elevate the ketones and you put this tumor into a mu much less aggressive state. Now we developed and published the glucose ketone, ketone index calculator as a simple tool to allow cancer patients to, to know whether or not they're in the state of therapeutic ketosis. And I will talk about the difficulties in some of the patients trying to achieve this. It's simply the ratio of glucose to ketones in millimolar in the blood and we found that uh, uh, ratios of 1.0 or below will put a cancer patient into therapeutic ketosis. Uh, there's strategies to do this. But this then puts a damper on the ability of those tumor cells to grow rapidly. This gives us now an opportunity to move in and destroy the tumor with other therapies. Now, the first att attempt to do this, not knowing what was going on really, was uh, uh, Lyndon Nebling. Who, who, who treated two small children that had in, um, uh, aggressive, uh, non-responding uh, brain tumors. And she was able to show that when they took these kids, they were considered hopeless cases, published this, and was able to show that the quality of life improved dramatically and the overall survival of both children was far greater than what was expected. We followed up on this in our own work at Boston College to figure out you know, what are the mechanisms that underlie what, Nin what Linda Nebling found in the human and we showed the SDUR standard carbohydrate, high carbohydrate diet, UR is unrestricted. So the animals eat all they want. The same diet was restricted by 40%, just cutting down, just cutting down the amount of food the animal ate by 40%. And, we can, and you can see, you can see the size reduction. The size of the tumor was massively reduced, anywhere from 65 to 85%. What is the mechanism that's responsible for this? How is it possible that you could have this kind of a response simply by cutting the calories down? So we did a linear regression analysis, looking at the relationship between blood ketone levels and gl blood glucose levels in the blood of these animals under different dietary conditions. So each square is a mouse under a different dietary condition. You see on the left, as blood sugar goes down, beta-hydroxybutyrate, the major circulating ketone body in the blood, goes up. This is an evolutionarily, evolutionarily conserved adaptation to food restriction. It happens even greater in humans than it does in the mice. On the right, you can see as blood sugar goes down, the size of the tumor goes down. The higher the blood circulating blood sugar, the faster the tumor grows. The lower the circulating blood sugar, the slower the tumor grows. This has now been validated in, humus, in numerous human cancers, breast cancer, colon cancer, 
brain cancer, hyperglycemia will stimulate tumor growth. So if people would like their tumors to grow as fast as they can possibly get them, they should make sure they get their blood sugar as high as they possibly can. It sounds absurd, but if you go to the oncology clinics, you will often see cancer patients with soda, coke, and ice cream and candy. It appears that those individuals are unaware of the massive data linking blood sugar to tumor growth. We, we identified the molecular mechanisms by which this works. So restricting glucose in the blood is powerfully anti-angiogenic as long as the ketone bodies are up. It's powerfully anti-inflammatory. It's unbelievable how powerful uh, 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 reducing the inflammation in the microenvironment. And that's a key for spreading tumor cells, is reducing inf inflammation. And it kills some of the tumor cells by an apoptotic or programmed cell death mechanism. So we looked at, there's no known drug in the cancer industry that is as powerful as doing this. What I'd like to share with you now are the results in using the STOOP protocol, which is the standard protocol for treating glioblastoma everywhere in the world. In every known country that I have been to and visited, this STOOP protocol is the standard uh, of care for glioblastoma involving surgical debulking, followed by radiotherapy or concomitantly with TMZ temozolomide, temozolomide, a toxic alkylating agent, and corticosteroids are often prescribed, but that's not part of what we call the standard of care. But if you look at the data, of survival data from this, uh, this diagram, from this figure, you see that every one, in the, every one of the patients in the study that received radiation died. There was no survivors. The major breakthrough, what they called a major breakthrough when it was announced, was if we put TMZ together with radiotherapy, we got a little bit of an increase in progression-free survival and a slight increase in overall, survi overall survival. And this was kind of interesting because TMZ increases so-called driver mutations, which should make the tumor grow faster. How is it possible that I give a drug that increases driver mutation and improves overall progression-free survival by only a slight bit? And as I've published, I said, well, what does temozolomide do? Nausea, vomiting, fatigue, diarrhea. These are all indirect forms of calorie restriction. No one has ever put in the proper, proper controls to really identify what is going on here. Now, it's even more remarkable. If we look at patient survival across institutions, all right, so this is a f the, the results from five institutions, a study that was done out of Canada, and they looked at various survivals in the different institutions. And you can see the survival is abysmal. It is such a stereotypical response for glioblastoma patients to die like this, all right? It, they're, they're almost all dead. And, they, and this is replicated across multiple institutions. And this is not just here. It's in, it, the Stoop protocol was for the United States. We see it in Germany, Japan. We see it all over. This is the standard of what happens. So the question you have, we have to ask ourselves, what is going on here? I mean, this is the hard evidence to say that very few people survive glioblastoma. What is responsible? for this demise of these poor people. So we published the paper first in Lancet Oncology and then just recently again, outlying in excruciating detail what is going on here to account for the failure of these people to survive. So what do we do? We debulk the, as soon as the patient comes in is diagnosed with glioblastoma, the whole patient and the family are stunned by this diagnosis. They, the surgeon will take the tumor out immediately. And what that does is creates a wound inside that person's head that releases masses amounts of glucose and glutamine into the tumor microenvironment from the very surgical procedure that's being taken place. Right after the patient recovers, they are given a, 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 an extended period of radiation therapy. Radiation therapy breaks apart the, the tightly regulated glutamine and glutamate cycle in the normal cells of the brain. This releases masses amounts of glutamine into the microenvironment and glutamate, which increases the, the cytotoxicity of the normal, normal, normal cells, further bathing the tumor in glutamine. Because your brain swells after radiation therapy, a lot of edema, you give high-dose corticosteroids, dexamethasone, as a way to reduce the edema, but at the same time, you jack up circulating blood sugar. So you, you create an environment 
where the sugar and the glutamine are just abundant in the new microenvironment of the tumor. This can account in large part for why few, if any, of these people survive. You have created, by the very treatments of these people, the environment responsible for their demise. Now, how do you think that went over in the field? Silence, dead silence. These, these cells are infected with human cytomegalovirus, which acts as a supercharger for bringing glucose and glutamine into the tumor cells. It's unbelievable. The fact that anyone could even survive this is just remarkable. So this guy is Pablo Kelly. Now, Pablo contacted me back in 2014. He was just diagnosed with glioblastoma multiforme, young man. He says, I don't want surgery. I don't want radiation. I don't want anything. He asked me what I, what I should, I said, well, hey, listen, I'm not a physician, but I said you might want to check out ketogenic metabolic therapy, which is a way to lower blood sugar and elevate ketones. He says, is it hard? I said, I don't know, you do it and tell me what it's like. So he went off and did it, and uh, they said, well, Pablo, you're going to be dead in about a year if, that's, if, if, if that, because you just rejected everything. And they said you have an inoperable glioblastoma, which was diagnosed and validated by, by histology. There's no way you're going to do any, any better. So after two years, I thought Pablo was a goner. He emailed me. He said, I'm thinking about having my tumor debulk now, because they said it shrunk down. It became operable. Oh. I said, well, you know, you might want to try it. So he, after two years of just metabolic therapy, he has this tumor taken out, and he seems to be doing pretty well. As of this month, Pablo is now a five-year survivor. Okay? Now, people... People say, well, he's an anecdote, but he's not an anecdote because um, uh, Andrew Scarborough, Alison Gannett, we have a number of people, but he's a pioneer to say to the medical establishment, I don't want what you're offering is bold because you get browbeaten, you get, you get intimidated uh, by, by rejecting this. We have published and shown exactly what's going on and why those ther therapies are doing what they do. Now we want to go on and look and see how we can manage this disease better. And in order to do that, you have to have a tool. And we developed the singular best model for glioblastoma, a spontaneous tumor arising in the mouse that we characterize as having all of the characteristics seen in human glioblastoma. Replicates everything. Most of the models that we have for tr treating glioblastoma are xenografts, patient-derived xenografts. These things don't represent the real world. We also genetically engineered the cells so they can be bioluminescent. So when we do treat these animals, we can then ask what, in fact, we're doing to the tumor. Are we, are we effective or not effective? Now, this is one of our first studies, and it's very interesting. The tumor on the left are the animals that ate. You can see the dark purple cells. Those are the tumor cells. And the hippocampus is a part of the brain. So a standard high-carbohydrate diet, you can, these tumor cells grew and invaded from one side of the brain to the other side of the brain very rapidly. Then we put the mice on very strict calorie restriction and restricted ketogenic diets, and we noticed just by looking at the histology of the mouse's brain, we got a sharper demarcation of the tumor. The invasion wasn't nearly as prominent as the mice that ate all the high-carbohydrate food. But we, can, we said, well, we pounded these mice with these diets and restrictions, but we weren't able to eliminate the tumor. Humans do much better than the mice. It's much harder to cure cancer in mouse than it is in human and despite what you might have heard from other people. Uh, this, we said, what is going on here? So we knew glutamine was the, other, was the other wild card, so we said, what about if we try to target the glutamine and see what happens? So we chose this drug, 6-diazo-5-oxo-L-norleucine, uh, uh, which is Don. It's an old drug from the literature. They used it on cancer patients years ago, but they never targeted glucose when they used the Don, and they only got partial effects. So we decided to combine Don with calorie-restricted ketogenic diets as a one-two punch to see whether or not we could manage the tumor. So this then uh, removes uh, the, the, the metabolites that would be needed to grow the tumor. We just published this paper, just came out in the Nature Journal of Communications Biology, for those of you who like to read the details. Um, it's an international group of, of folks from Boston College, Harvard, and uh, uh, Semmelweis, we had Gabriel from um, Venezuela, we had a whole group of people on here 
to, to, to look at this. So what we did is we combined calorie-restricted ketogenic diet to target the glucose, and we used uh, a Don tar to target glutamine. So here's the strategy. It's very simple. You know the glucose is driving the tumor through the lactic acid fermentation and the pentose phosphate pathway, and you know glutamine is producing the, the metabolites needed for DNA and RNA synthesis and for the energy, the energy driving the beast. So the strategy is you use the diet to target the glucose and you use the Don to target the glutamine because there's no other fuels that these tumor cells can use. They are all screwed up. They have to ferment and these are the two fermentable fuels available. So here's the experimental design. We put the tumors into the mouse's brain day zero and then at three days let them grow really big and then we, we put them on a fast and then we reintroduce the high carb diet or the ketogenic diet restricted and then a couple of days later, we pulsed six, eight, we pulsed the dawn because, listen, glutamine is a key metabolite for our immune system, our gut, and the urea cycle. You can't be too aggressive when you're targeting glutamine. You have to, be, do, you have to do this strategically. So the, the animals are on a press of glucose and a pulse of glutamine. We terminate the experiment at 15 days because the guys eating the high-carbohydrate diet are starting to become moribund. So we have to stop the study and then we have to examine all of the subjects. We take the brain out of the mouse and we put it in a dish and we do ex vivo bioluminescence imaging on the mouse's brain with the tumor. The blue light and the yellow and the red indicates how many living tumor cells are in this animal's brain. So you can see on the high-carbohydrate SDUR, you get a lot of light. Yeah, you still get light on the ketogenic diet restricted. Wow, I told you that. It's not able to completely kill these tumor cells. But when you put the glutamine inhibitor in with the, the, the glucose targeting diet, you get no light. Indicative, suggestive that there's no living tumor cells left in the brains of these mice. Here are the data from the paper. Uh, the ketogenic diet restricted, I said you still have light. Of course, the light is less than the standard diet, but it's still there. And we only had one mouse, number 12, that had somewhat of a little, everything else is, is background. So there's only one mouse out of the treatment group that had a slight amount of light. And on the right, you can see the whole bar statistics on how we analyze the data. Highly significant reduction in bioluminescence in the brains when you target glucose and glutamine. And this, of course, the gold standard is what's going on. You have to use histology. So a high carbohydrate diet, SDUR, these cells can't grow any faster. They're stumbling over. The mitotic figures are on top of each other. The ketogenic diet restricted. You can see the white part of the brain. You, the, it, the cells are not invading as rapidly as they are when they're under high carbohydrate diets. You can see the white part, the white region. That's the normal region of the brain. So you can see the blue is on the left, the white. But on the other one, you can see them invading big time. Then when you take ketogenic diet restricted with Don, you're targeting glucose and glutamine simultaneously, you get massive cell death, necrotic death. It looks like a battlefield. So this validates the fact that we don't see bioluminescence because the cells are dead. The cells are dead. We're seeing it right here on the histology. Then we looked at the other tumor, the very aggressive stem cell tumor, because I told you at the beginning of this lecture, the GBM contains rapidly growing stem cells and these highly invasive mesenchymal cells. You have two different kinds of cells. The field is all torn between, oh, this and that. You can kill them both. They all need glucose and glutamine. It doesn't make any difference. They're all vulnerable to the same approach. And this shows us that we kill them by mitotic catastrophe, which is a different kind of death than necrotic death. So personally, I don't care. I don't care how the tumor cells are dying. And I don't think the patient cares either. They just want to know, can you kill my tumor cell without killing me? So here's the survival. So you can see the, the blue is the, the high carb diet. The green line is the ketogenic diet by itself. The red line is the drug by itself. And when you, the purple line is when you put the drug and the diet together, you get, you get much longer overall survival that none of these treatments by themselves can do. One of the most fascinating things we found from this study was that when you administer the Don drug in the presence of the restricted ketogenic diet, we were able to deliver two to three times more drug on target because we administered the drug together with the ketogenic diet. And I saw this once before in our work with uh, Tay-Sachs disease. It appears that the ketogenic diet is a facilitator of drug delivery through the blood-brain barrier, which has been a challenge in the field of, of neuro-oncology and neurobiology for decades. 
So we think we have found a, a non-toxic mechanism to get things on target without harming the patient. It's an interesting observation. Now, based on all of our research over the years, I teamed up with some physicians, and we put together with, jo with Dom Diagostino, myself, George Yu, and, and Joe Maroon, we put together a strategy where which we think we can manage the majority of cancers non-toxically. It's called press pulse. It comes from the concepts of paleobiology. I don't have time to talk about all that. What we do is we use a press therapy. You got to get the growth of this tumor under control before you start doing anything. And the best way to do that is you pull the plug on their glucose and you reduce the inflammation in the microenvironment. You slow the beast down. You can use ketone supplements. You need stress management. People with cancer and GBM especially are freaked out. That means their cortisol levels are high, their blood sugars are high because they have an impending doom. You have to do, we use exercise therapy, yoga, all kinds of different things to reduce blood sugar, and we can measure that. Then we go after, with pulse therapies, we start targeting glucose specifically, glutamine specifically, and hyperbaric oxygen. You see, once you remove the glucose and glutamine, the cells become vulnerable to death by oxidative stress. Now, the most common way to kill tumor cells by oxidative stress is radiation therapy. But as you know, radiation therapy contributes to a lot of problems. Can we kill the tumor cells by, this, by a similar mechanism without the toxicity? But you've got to take away the fuels before you can do that, and that's what our plan is here. So we move the patient from a very severe state, and many of these patients are metabolically screwed up anyway. They have all kinds of triglyceridemias, and they have all kinds of other stuff. So while we're killing the cancer cells, we're moving the patient from a state of unhealth to a, to a managed state, and eventually to a long-term uh, management or resolution. Press pulse metabolic therapy. Now we tried this on a patient from Egypt. So the group uh, contacted me, and they said, we've got this young man, his whole left side is paralyzed. The guy, he was also metabolically uh, abnormal. He had triglyceridemia, high he had all kinds of things. He was a corn farmer. He came in, all paralyzed. So we put him on a water-only fasting for three days and then a very low uh, uh, keto car uh, calorie ketogenic diet for uh, three weeks. And then they did it, we did an awake craniotomy on this guy. Responded really well. Immediately transitioned him back to uh, restricted diets, intermediate fasting, fasting, and then we used hyperbaric oxygen and we put in chloroquine, uh, chloroquine uh, the anti-malarial drug, as a way to stop autophagy. We used a very weak EGCG green tea extract. I, you know, it just, we don't have access to Don. We don't have access to Don in this patient. Then we said, the guy's doing really well. He's, he's arm wrestling. He's, 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 oh, it's amazing. Now we have to irradiate him. So I said to my physician colleagues there, why are we doing this? The guy is doing so well. No, no, we have to do it. It's part of the standard of care. Even in Egypt, everywhere we go, we have to do this radiation thing. So you know, I had, we had no choice. So they took this guy and they irradiated him. But we also kept him on low carbohydrate diets. We had him hyperbaric oxygen, even though he took temozolomide and even though he had this radiation treatment. So how does he, he did pretty well. I said, how does he do? Yeah, he seems to survive. Oh, good. So we kept him going and then he, he started getting really well. Um, he went back out working in the fields as a corn farmer. I, I kept saying, wow, this guy's really responding well. And then you can see, we, we lowered the blood sugar, we got the GKI down, the guy's in the zone that we think is going to manage the disease, he's doing real. And if you look at the panel on the bottom, you see the red line, the red line shift. You can see the brain shifted. As we began the treatments, okay, the, re the, re the line becomes straight. So we're shrinking this tumor down, the guy is doing good. We published at 24 months out, two years. This guy is doing well. Then at about 27, 28 months, he complains of headaches. So El Saka calls me up and he says, emails me and he says, listen, the patient has uh, got some problems. So I said, what's going on? And he says, he doesn't seem to be doing well. I said, oh man, the tumor's recurring. So they did a debulking uh, surgery on the guy. And we found in the, in the pathology report, liquefaction of the brain due to radiation necrosis. Guy died from radiation necrosis. They didn't find any tumor cells. So um, the standard of care. So we wrote this paper. And you'll see um, El, El Sock is on there. Joe Maroon, my, my friend, he's the team surgeon of the Pittsburgh Steelers, uh, former president of the Neurosurgical Society of America. Um, we put together this question that Joe says is more than provocative. Uh, should ketogenic 
metabolic therapy become the standard of care for glioblastoma? Um, what do you think? Um, the problem is here, as I wrote it in excruciating detail, we showed exactly why these patients are dying. They're dying from the radiation, in part. There's two ways to survive GBM. There's two ways. You've got to go into ketogenic metabolic therapy. I'm not saying you don't do surgery, but you've got to stop the radiation. And that's the hardest thing to do. So it's my opinion that replacement of standard of care with KMT will improve progression-free survival and overall survival for most GBM patients. People ask me, what would I do if I got a GBM? I said I would never do radiation. I would never do temozolomide. I'd fight the bastard just like Pablo did. And I would roll my dice with that because I know I wouldn't be provoking the tumor to kill me. GBM in most cancers is a type of mitochondrial metabolic disease. It's not a genetic disease. I don't have time to tell you all of the evidence now that undermines the gene theory of cancer. Yet, most of the treatments that we're using for cancer patients throughout the world is based on the somatic mutation theory of cancer, and I attribute that in part for why we have over 1,600 people a day in the United States dying. They're being, they're being mistreated, and, and the disease is completely misunderstood by the majority of practitioners in the field. The reliance on substrate-level phosphorylation for energy is the metabolic hallmark of glioblastoma and all cancers. I'm writing a big cancer on breast cancer, same thing. Simultaneous restriction of glucose and glutamine can help manage GBM in perhaps most other cancers, and we're now seeing this in all other kinds of cancers. The press pulse metabolic therapy is a non-toxic, cost-effective strategy for the possible management of GBM in most cancers. The biggest problem with this strategy is cost-effective. It's not revenue generation, which is the underpinning of the large part of the cancer industry. We're collecting more and more physicians and scientists who recognize that this might be the way to go for the eventual management and resolution of cancer. You can see from all these different countries, and they're joining us, we're starting a global society for metabolic therapy which will eventually break through the stagnation that we have presently in this entire cancer field. And you know, let me tell you, you can get a lot of money when you want to study how something works. You get very little money when you try to resolve the disease. So I'm thanking the Travis Christofferson's Foundation for Metabolic Therapies, Joe Mercola, George Yu Foundation, Greg Glassman of the seat president and CEO of CrossFit has supported us. Joe Maroon, team surgeon for the, New York, for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Ellen Davis, Boston College Research Fund, and in the past, the NIH, and thank you for your attention.